the way that this uh, presentation is put together is to really talk about uh, the potential failure modes for embankments associated with earthquakes, evaluate the performance of embankments during earthquakes. Again, what's my system response, right? Am I gonna, am I gonna uh, have a lot of deformation? Is, is there something that's gonna be problematic where it's not gonna actually perform, uh, continue to perform as designed after the event, right? Or, or lose enough freeboard to lose the, uh, the reservoir. Discuss the, uh, the ground uh, levels of ground motion that trigger liquefaction. What kind of uh, ground motions do we need in order to have uh, uh, these problematic behaviors that we get in seismic events occur? Um, and the magnitude of embankment deformation during a seismic event. So in these histories, only approximately 1.5% of historical dam failures uh, of embankment dams have been attributed to earthquakes. We've had some big motions. Um, and, and some of what we call a dam failure is something we wouldn't call a dam safety failure today. We had a potential to lose the reservoir, but we didn't. We got lucky, so to speak. The water level was such, the dam deformed in a way that it didn't actually release the reservoir. Um, but we've had some, uh, some major um, deformations with our dams. We had in Sheffield Dam uh, in 1925, um, we had a foundation liquefaction uh, occur in this dam uh, uh, due to the earthquake in 1925. And we had a uh, failure of the dam, as you can see here. It actually did release the reservoir. It flooded San Diego. No one got killed. Um, we got lucky. It was, the, the flood depth wasn't deep enough, um, but we did uh, lose the dam in 1925. Lower San Fernando Dam is the one you usually see when we talk about seismic performance of embankment dams. Um, we had an earthquake in 1971. We lost the upstream slope of that dam. We were very lucky. There was a remnant uh, of the crest that was there that maintained the reservoir long enough for us to lower the dam. So we actually did not get an uncontrolled release of the water and we didn't kill anyone. But um, this is kind of a little bit what I was talking about, about you can have bad performance of the dam. Uh, you can guarantee that uh, we didn't continue to put water in this dam after, uh, after we lowered the water from that uh, reservoir. Um, in 2001, uh, Fujinama Dam uh, in Japan, uh, we had a um, liquefaction uh, in the foundation uh, with, during the Tohoku magnitude 9 earthquake with the ground accelerations around 0.3 G. Um, and they were also, um, and, and it failed and sent water downstream. Uh, and then there were also several uh, levees um, <clears throat> in Japan that either failed or were severely damaged. Um, uh, USSD performance of dams during earthquakes volumes one through three is also a good resource for additional information on performance of embankments during earthquakes. But again, that key takeaway from our case histories is that only about 1.5% of historical failures of embankment dams um, have been attributed to earthquakes. Um, so there's a frequency component that plays a critical role here, like we talked about with the um, risk equation. Um, so for uh, general steps uh, for evaluation of seismic risk for embankment, first we have to gain an understanding of the site conditions uh, by using several techniques, including STPs, cone penetration, geophysical testing, undisturbed lab testing, et cetera. Uh, most importantly, talk to your geologist. Uh, the geologist is gonna play a key role in helping us understand what we have at that site. Um, <clears throat> and then we have to develop site-specific failure modes. Um, for example, if overtopping failure due to deformation is unlikely, Maybe only cracking due to differential settlement needs to be evaluated. Um, then we'll develop uh, event trees for the different failure modes. Um, and in some cases, the failure modes can be evaluated in one event tree. Um, we'll obtain our site-specific loading conditions. That's what Keith uh, talked about to us uh, before lunch. Um, if the reservoir is empty or has a large amount of freeboard, maybe the failure mode is not a significant risk contributor and can be screened out right away um, and that's what we talked about over here as far as that probability then getting very low of actually having enough water behind the dam to have a release, even if you get bad performance from your dam from that earthquake. And so um, once it's determined that the um, seismic failure modes are significant risk contributors, then a more rigorous analysis should be completed, including liquefaction, deformation analysis, site-specific seismic loads, all of that sort of thing to really be able to understand and really reduce the amount of uncertainty and really understand what that system response is. But your risk is still, your risk may still be acceptable 
or tolerable, or we, again, not have a risk-driving failure mode, even if we assume an SRP of one, if we don't have a high enough probability of the earthquake and water behind the dam to a level that's gonna release, right? <clears throat> so we may not actually need to fully define the SRP of the system response in order to screen out the risk, uh, that the failure mode. Doesn't mean that you may not have other issues as far as operability of that dam down the road and some other things that you wanna think about, but from a dam safety perspective, we may be able to screen that out. And the last thing that we need to do is evaluate the consequences. And now we do this for our floods kind of categorically, if you will, but we have to remember that when we have an earthquake or a seismic event, it's a different kind of a failure mode. And so if it's a static, or excuse me, a, a, a seismic liquefaction failure happens quickly, and it could be a failure where you're gonna lose the reservoir within a matter of, um, of minutes, of, 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 of an hour. Um, it's a sunny day failure. You've had no warning. You have no ability to, uh, uh, people aren't actually looking for this. So the, the amount of people that you have, your warning times, all of that is gonna change. And then you also may have some damage um, to some of your uh, infrastructure. So you may have escape routes uh, that are impaired. So what you've done for flooding may not actually be and probably won't be necessarily applicable to your seismic failure modes in order to understand uh, your consequences and calculate your risks. <clears throat> so some of the, um, so the, the, for seismic event we've talked about and we'll, and we'll talk about here, uh, some of the other failure modes that you can have. The main mechanism that we have problem with, with uh, uh, as far as um, seismic risk is liquefaction. That's a significant loss of shear strength of, of material that has a, 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 very, a very good resistance to failure, or, or like a sand material that's, that's fairly strong, that is suddenly gonna lose strength in a seismic event if your seismic load is high enough. And so liquefaction occurs um, when the earthquake shaking causes that water pressure that's in the sand, to, that water pressure increases in the soils, it reduces the shear strength of the soil, um, and suddenly you have very low strength sand uh, in an instant. If, 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 it, if it happens under a foundation of a building, it'll be like what Keith showed you with a, a building that's, uh, that's tipped over. Suddenly you just have no strength in your soil at all there. Um, saturated, uh, clean, loose, cohesionless, uh, un uncompacted materials, hydraulic like fill, um, and, and loose alluvial materials are most susceptible. Um, and again, these alluvial valleys, uh, or where we often will see liquefiable, natural liquefiable soils, and that's where we, we, we tend to, to build our, uh, our earth embankment. So if we're not, uh, if we have a dam that we didn't actually excavate out, loose sand from under the foundation, we have a liquefaction hazard, or a uh, potential for liquefaction. Um, we talk about liquefaction, we reserve that term for granular soils and the mechanism that actually occurs to allow sands to lose their strength. Um, and granular soils, it can happen in gravels as well, uh, sandy gravels especially. Um, but we also get other kinds of strength loss during a seismic event. We can have clays that will cyclically soften. It's usually a normally consolidated clay, um, a soft clay uh, that's gonna have the greatest strength loss. Uh, if we think about like, a, you know, or it could be something like a, a very brittle clay, like uh, if you think about the Rissa landslide and those, uh, the clays that they have in Sweden, the quick clays, that once they reach go past their peak, they suddenly become fluid. Uh, you get these kind of phenomena of strength loss in clays, but we don't get what we would classically call liquefaction. Um, so other uh, typical potential failure modes, um, the upper right uh, here um, is referred to, commonly referred to as a flow slide where the deformation causes crest settlement to exceed freeboard and leads to an overtopping failure or if freeboard remains, it could lead to a crack-induced internal erosion failure. Um, the rest of these in here um, are for cracking related to failure where either the soft foundation compresses um, and causes cracking in the overlying embankment or the loose outer shells pull away from the core causing cracking and shorten, seep shorten seepage paths and eventually lead to an internal erosion failure. So even if I don't uh, actually get enough of a movement uh, to actually immediately over top and have my reservoir come over the top of the dam, if I develop enough cracks, I can get concentrated uh, leak erosion through those cracks. Um, and I can then eventually end up with an internal erosion uh, type failure mode uh, from the seismic event. 
Um, also, as Keith mentioned, uh, cracking due to fault rupture, um, and then we get different kinds of, um, of crack uh, that develop in the dams depending on the type of um, the type of fault uh, that would be immediately under the dam. But as Keith also mentioned, we do not, we don't have many dams that are actually located directly on uh, on a fault. Um, we also may see uh, cracking due to embedded or adjacent structures. Um, uh, such as uh, at conduit contacts, um, spillway wall contacts, uh, and, and concrete embankment rack around stretch, uh, sections. We'll get, again, different kinds of um, uh, defects in our dam, uh, potential defects in, those dam, in our dam uh, based on these various kinds of structures. Spillway wall contacts can be an important one because we, these are typically transverse orientation, which means they'd be through the dam, which, again, would make it be more problematic from a concentrated leak erosion standpoint. Um, than something that might happen more uh, uh, along the axis of the dam or longitudinally. Um, and then um, this has animations on it that I didn't mean to leave on here. Um, but I did put this in. Um, so this is part of the, what's happening in the uh, Pacific Northwest right now is that, um, so, so this slide in general, this is a, a list of more likely factors for seismic deformation damage that I took directly out of best practices. And it just kind of gives you a list of sort of the, the, the elements that might uh, cause you to have a higher probability of having um, uh, seismic deformations and a bad system response or system performance, right? Deformations in your bank. And I highlighted in slide some of the changes that, um, that we are sort of Looking to clarify, if you will, and the seismic cadre is coming on right now. And, and one of the main things that's happening right now in our industry is that the way we look at gravels and rock fills is shifting. So when I started my career, when we had a rock fill, we gave it 45 degrees, we said it's free draining. And that's true for what we usually think of a rock fill, which is big riprap, big holes, and lots of pore space, right? But we have dams in the Pacific Northwest that are called rock fill, and they have material that's big say cobbles, and maybe it's rounded river cobbles, but it's a lot of gravel, it's a lot of sand, and we have natural gravels, alluvial gravels, and those gravels, they're not like the gravel you see at Home Depot. It's not got huge pore spaces that aren't gonna, uh, that don't have a potential really to generate high pore pressures. It's, it's gravel with a whole lot of sand and silt in it, in the matrix. And if you imagine, if you get enough of that stuff, you may actually still classify as a gravel, but you may not have point to point with all of your gravels. So now you have gravels floating in a sand matrix, right? By weight, it's 50% gravel, but by volume, it may be more like 50% sand, and you may not actually have point to point. And now your, your matrix is supported by sands and silts. Guess what, sands and silts that are loose? We've always known they're liquefied. So we had a classification problem, if you wanna call it that, where when we thought about gravels, we weren't thinking about these materials and we didn't have as much information maybe about these materials to understand exactly what was placed. And some of these materials with their wet and there's big seismic load, they could liquefy, right? So now we're in, now, so what, what Keith was talking about was the dams up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and those dams have some gravels in them. And we are now going back to take a look at them because they've got significant seismic loads. So our probabilities of occurrence become a little higher. We maintain water behind those dams for a much longer period during the year because it gets used like fish passage and, and recreation and other things. So it's not like our California dams that sit dry until there's a big flood. These, these look like, they, they look like water supply reservoirs to you if you don't know any better. So they've got significant water. And now we have materials that for many decades, we said didn't behave badly in a seismic event. And now we're having to come back and look at them and say, wait a minute, What's actually placed there may not be behaving the way we thought we thought of these materials. And that's not the core, that's industry-wide. This whole uh, gravel liquefaction and, and, and rock fill, going back and re-looking re at this sort of thing. And so, um, so if the potential uh, failure mode can't be screened out, then we perform uh, the following uh, here for, um, each selected earthquake and reservoir load combination. This includes estimating the likelihood of liquefaction or seismic softening, i.e. are we gonna get strength loss during this, this event? 
estimating the residual shear strength of the materials that may liquefy or may experience shear lo strength loss, and estimating the deformation of the embankment due to instability and seismic compression. If the crust settlement is greater than the freeboard and overtopping size can occur, and again, if the freeboard remains, a crack induced internal erosion failure can occur. And all of these processes will be touched on in later slides. So here's a, oops. Oh, and yeah, okay. And then, and then we have to actually complete the inventory for you know, overtopping failure or, um, or internal erosion failure. So if this is our event tree for seismic overtopping, um, our first we're gonna have uh, because for different levels of shaking, I can have different uh, responses. I might trigger uh, liquefaction at higher PGAs, but not at lower PGAs. So I might not have strength loss at lower PGAs. So I have a different response of my um, embankment. Um, I do have to think about what's my reservoir range or my uh, riverside uh, water level range if I'm doing a levee. Uh, and, and is it, what's, at what point does this, at what return intervals do we start to see problematic behavior uh, or problematic uh, risk numbers, if you will? I.e., uh, how high does it have to be to have a problem from a, a risk standpoint? And what are those return intervals or what is, what is the probability or Excuse me, what is the percentage of the year? What is the, the, the frequency that it's actually at those levels? Because only when those two things happen, this, this earthquake and that reservoir is high enough, am I gonna have an issue from a risk standpoint? Then I look at whether or not I trigger uh, strength loss, whether my deformation exceeds freeboard. If, this, if it does, now I've gotta add to the end of this, my overtopping failure, all of those nodes, right? Because I still have to, even if it goes over the top, I've still got to actually lead to a full breach of the dam. I've got to road the dam, right? What's left, the, the remnants that are left or the, the sections that's left. And if it's no, then I either can use this tree to then go through and say, okay, well, what's the probability I get a crack? That crack have to be to be problematic. What's the probability of that crack? And then what's the probability that I get concentrated lethal erosion that then goes to failure and goes to full breach? Um, I can do that either in a separate risk tree or, or event tree, or I can do that in this one. So um, this is the plot that uh, Keith showed earlier uh, of the um, annual exceedance versus uh, peak ground acceleration. Um, and the most common approach, like we said before, was to just develop these bins and look at uh, what, the, what the response of the, uh, the magnet would be in those various bins. Um, <clears throat> And so we might find, um, you know, so so we might find that uh, we just find that um, if we say if we trigger at uh, at, at uh, um, if we start to lose strength at at uh, a, a 2475 event, you know, we might have um, we might have two to five feet of deformation at uh, 20 in, in this bin as far as uh, between 475 and, and and 2475 on that branch of the tree. Um, and when we go to a, a, a bin with a higher earthquake load, uh, we may end up with more like uh, 10 to 15 feet. Uh, we may end up with 25 feet. What, what also may happen is that um, at different triggering levels, we may actually, uh, excuse me, at different levels of earthquake load, we may actually trigger different uh, foundation layers within the dam, right? Or either, either uh, zones within the dam or, or layers in the foundation. And so you may actually have something that is at a full uh, um, drain strength uh, at, a, at a loading bin uh, between 475 and two, uh, 2475. And then suddenly when I, uh, when I increase the earthquake load, now I get triggering of that layer and it, re it reduces the shear strength and then I get significant changes in um, deformation and may actually change my failure mode. And then again, what we talked about kind of conceptually is this, uh, is this uh, point about the probability of having a pool that's high enough to allow for um, a dam failure to occur and release of water and a breach and water to go downstream. Um, and so what we do with this is we do not use the um, flood frequency curves, we use the stage duration curves. So we look at, what's, at, at what percentage of time um, do we actually have uh, a pool elevation at a level that's actually going to be problematic? And then we, we factor down 
uh, our probability of occurrence by that percentage of time. And then, uh, so this is what uh, Keith actually mentioned as well, is this joint loading probability um, uh, tool, toolbox, um, where we can actually look at different um, bins, uh, either, uh, so for on the, on the seismic uh, side of things, we're gonna look at, uh, for the earthquake, we're gonna look at different um, PGAs, different levels of seismic loading, um, and, and, and do uh, multiple bins of that. And then we're gonna put some bins uh, as about our water level, and what are the probabilities, uh, What's from our stage um, duration curve, what are the uh, probabilities associated with those water levels? What are the probabilities, the annual exceedance probabilities for those seismic events? When we multiply them together, we then get that probability of load out of the risk equation. And then we can look at these numbers and, and we can start to say to ourselves, okay, well, if I add them all up, well, wait a minute. And I, I think this might be for a reclamation dam or for a dam that's operated with a higher pool for most of the year. Um, or a good portion, I can add up all my total probability of failure and I might be as high as you know, 1.3 times 10 to the minus two. Well, that's problematic. But what I've done here, I'm not even looking at my system response at this point, right? I'm not even saying, uh, do, all, do I actually have bad performance from my dam in every one of these bins? That's not really the risk, right? That's just the probability of the load. And we can actually use this, we can multiply it by consequences in order to get a feel for that part of the risk equation. And if we use an SRP of one for the dam, it'll tell us where we have the potential to have a, a, a probability or, or, or a risk number that is high enough that we would actually need to go for an air plan, right? Because it can't be, the SRP for the dam can't be any higher than one. We can't have a probability of failure any higher than one, That's right? So the risk numbers that are, uh, if we multiply these by our consequences, we will have an upper bound on how, how much risk we could have, and then we would actually have to look at the performance of the dam. If we go through and look at the performance of a dam, for this particular slide, um, as an example, uh, when they did the analysis for the dam, it, we said, okay, well, the structure will perform extremely well for uh, um, PGA levels, uh, peak ground acceleration levels less than 0.45 G, and reservoir loadings less than elevation um, 89 feet. And so we zeroed out everything except this area here. Now, what we don't know is exactly what the probability failure is for the dam at this point. We're still saying, let's just assume if the load happen, the, happens, the dam, we have, we, have a, we have a failure, right? We, we have a water going downstream. We, don't, we haven't done the rest of the risk equation. But just based on the probability of the loading alone for the range of reservoir levels, we can actually have probability of the release. Um, we can add those all up. And like in this particular example, you'd be down at two times 10 to the minus seven, which means it's not a risk factor, which means you don't actually need to know what the dam does in order to assess whether you have elevated risk from this failure mode. You can screen it out. But it doesn't mean your dam won't necessarily behave badly if, if, uh, if you have an event that, lar that large. Um, it just means that um, we don't necessarily have uncertainty about the risk decision-making process at that point because we know that our actual risk numbers are going to be lower than that. So if we're going to actually go through and, and we decide that we need to actually figure out what the, res the response of the dam is, we need to figure out what the likelihood of liquefaction is. And so there's a lot of... Uh, uh, there's a few actually different uh, methodologies that are out there. Um, the most commonly used um, and really a good place to start and probably what you'll use during your career unless you actually become a seismic specialist of sorts um, is Idris and Boulanger. And we have, um, so these uh, references uh, up here, uh, there are um, procedures and protocols and, and, uh, and, and discussions about what happens and how liquefaction occurs, if you will, uh, in these references uh, by Idris and Boulanger for CPT-based um, triggering and SPT-based triggering. So the kind of field data that you're likely to have uh, for your dam and for characterizing your material. And what they've done in these, and they're all about the same, the triggering relationships are all about the same, is they've looked at all the case histories, they've plotted um, a measurement of the density of the sand, blow counts corrected for clean, clean sand, um, for overburning clean sand. Uh, and then they plotted what they 
they calculated the earthquake loading to be, and this is the, called the cyclic stress ratio, and um, it's a measure of the earthquake loading and how much cyclic stress is imposed by the earthquake on that material. And where the red dots are, that's where they saw triggering, and where the open dots are, that's where they didn't. And so they drew some boundaries in here, and this is what we use to basically determine whether or not we think we would have triggering at our dam, if you will. Because if this is the cyclic stress ratio that caused triggering to happen in those case histories. So this is what we're gonna determine and we're gonna call our cyclic resistance ratio for our soil at whatever probability uh, uh, interval we wanna use or whatever uh, level of exceedance we wanna use. And, and for, you know, uh, we might be using a 50, 50 percentile for a best estimate. That's something we would talk about in elicitation. Um, but basically, I can say that for a blow count of 10, uh, my cyclic resistance ratio, I'm not, I'm not expecting to see trig uh, triggering at that, uh, at that return interval uh, for a cyclic stress ratio um, uh, less than uh, 0.11, right, or 0.12 here. And then I'm going to compare that with the load that I actually am going to calculate for the earthquakes that I have at my various um, earthquake or my various uh, return interval bins, right? My various loading bins. And so this equation, uh, so the, the, this equation is for actually calculating the cyclic uh, stress ratio of, um, of your events. Um, and it is a function of a few things. Uh, mostly this Amax is your, is your PGA, um, as effective stress and, and some of the stress conditions in your, in your, uh, at the location uh, where you're trying to predict triggering and your overburden, and then uh, this magnitude scaling factor. So one of the things like Keith talked about, these different uh, magnitude earthquakes and, and Cascadia versus Crestal and those sorts of things, all of these um, curves are actually generated for magnitude 7.5 event. And then we use a magnitude scaling factor as a proxy, because as it turns out, uh, not all 0.5 Gs are created equal. So 0.5 Gs on a Crestal event, it's gonna shake for maybe I don't know, 20 seconds or something, maybe 30 seconds for your whole record. In a Cascadia, it might shake for three minutes. And, and the Cascadia events, like Keith said, tend to be more like a magnitude nine. So it doesn't need 0.5G at three minutes because you have so many more cycles. You're gonna have so much longer shaking to generate pore pressures in. And so uh, in the end of the day, you can have a much lower PGA for a large event like a magnitude nine event and a Cascadia event that's gonna shake for a long time, you can have a much lower PGA actually trigger liquefaction than you do for a Crestle event, like a California event. Um, for cyclic softening of clays, uh, there's a protocol in there as well and, and um, for calculating a factor of safety for triggering of uh, cyclic softening of clays. Um, Basically, it's a function of the undrained shear strength of the clay. The cyclic resistance ratio is, the, is a function of the undrained shear strength of the clay. And there's equations in there for calculating um, what that cyclic, stress rate, cyclic resistance ratio is based on this S, and that's the undrained shear strength ratio uh, of a normally consolidated clay, of your clay in the normally consolidated range. And then you're going to use, you use the OCR. So kind of some of the stuff we talked about yesterday. How how uh, uh, how much clear you need to have? How much stiffer is it than a, a soft uh, uh, your clay when it's uh, soft and looser uh, and and uh, less dense? Um, that's that OCR number here. Uh, and the the M is like 0.8. It's uh, the the um, this is the um, this is a um, equation that was developed by Ladd and Foote for Shansep. So if you've ever used Shansep uh, to do under your center ratios of course, that's what this number is, uh, what this uh, equation, this formulation is here. Um, but you're gonna, you multiply by 0.8, it gives you a second persistence ratio for your dam, but it is actually directly proportional to your undrained shear strength ratio or your undrained shear strength for your clay. And you can compare that to the cyclic stress ratio that you've got uh, for the loading that we saw on the slide before. Um, and calculate a factor of safety. And then based on that factor of safety, then you would have to use uh, more likely and less likely factors to come to a probability because we don't really have probabilistic um, triggering um, 
relationships uh, for specific species of clay. Um, oh, and then uh, your uh, your shear strength uh, can be actually determined. Uh, your posts, if you if you do determine that you will cyclically soften, say you have a soft clay in your foundation, um, for your analysis to, in order to determine your deformations of the dam, then you would assign stuff and you would use um, CPT uh, cone penetration test results uh, uh, or uh, vein shear or other empirical correlations in order to get your um, Fully remolded strength, which is what we would assign for a cyclic, cyclic softening of a clay as a shear strength for post triggering. Wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. That's not good. Okay. Um, for, for your shear strength, once you get your finger in a um, spray material uh, for the perfection, um, there's a couple of different um, um, relationships out there. They're all kind of the same sort of thing as well. They, they've got uh, case history. Uh, information where they've done back analysis of um, historic failures. Oh, okay. Um, and then you would actually use these curves with your clean sand corrected low count to come up and 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 pick off a, um, a residual shear strength to then plug in uh, to your stability analysis or your deformation analysis to try to determine what your response of your dam would be. Um, Uh, to do to look at deformation, there are some uh, correlations out there um, that you can use uh, without actually going into any kind of analysis. Uh, uh, Swayzgood has a correlation. What's important to note on this correlation is that um, there are a few dams uh, where there was some liquefaction that triggered. Um, well, I wouldn't, these correlations are not developed to give you deformations of a dam if you have liquefaction, if, liquef if, liquef if you have strength loss in your layers. So you Seismically induced strength loss in your layers. Um, <clears throat> and what's important to kind of note here is that really for everything that didn't trig have, trigger liquefaction or have another um, uh, like a, a abutment landslide or some other issues, um, is that it all of these case histories, um, the estimated crest settlement is around 1%. So if you're not doing strength loss, that's a pretty typical number to use uh, unless you have something really unusual at uh, a as far as if you use as far as that upper bound sort of estimate or a reasonable estimate of what you might expect for performance. Um, you can also, if you're going to use Newmark, and some folks um, may have uh, some experience using Newmark, well, all I'm going to say about that at this point is that you cannot use that again if you trigger. If, if you have strength loss in your, uh, in your, of your materials, these, these methodologies are not appropriate for use uh, in estimating deformations. Um, and so what we're, we're pretty much left with at that point, for the most part, is actually doing something like a nonlinear deformation analysis. And that's our uh, these, uh, different finite element programs. Uh, we use FLAC quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of parameters that go in the mod. These models are not all intuitive. Um, they can be like your shear modulus, your density, uh, and Shear strengths that we, that we use fairly uh, often, um, but we also have to look at what we're going to put in. We either assign uh, um, post liquefaction strengths, post, -earth post earthquake strengths in layers that we've determined to trigger in other analyses, or we use more advanced constitutive models that actually allow us to have the, the program decide when it triggers and, and lower shear strengths. But they get pretty complex, and this is not anything you're ever going to do on an SQRA. This is uh, IES level stuff. This is the kind of thing that we're doing right now for the Willamette dams and what we're looking at. Um, the other alternative that you have um, to actually look at deformations, you can actually run programs like FLAC without actually putting a time history in. And you can run it in a post earthquake uh, sort of a, um, a mode where, again, you just you, you lower the shear strength in the layers that you've determined to trigger from your liquefaction triggering. Uh, analysis that you've done separate from this, you, you, you lower the shear strengths and then you just see how much is it going to move under gravity. And this is actually not a bad approach, especially when you're talking about shallow crustal events, um, because what, what we actually find is that most of the deformation due to liquefaction triggering does occur after the event. It takes the earthquake to trigger the liquefaction and reduce the, reduce the strength. And then if the strength is as low as it can be for liquefied soils, often your design didn't actually consider that low of a shear strength in that material. And under gravity loads, 
it will actually deform. And this is this is what happened at, at uh, San Fernando Dam. It, it, it did not trigger at the at the start or in the middle of the event. It actually lost shear strength and then um, deformed under gravity, static, static flows or just under gravity afterwards just because of that strength loss. Um, I know I'm over time. So internal erosion through cracks, um, we, we can get at it from, uh, from uh, deformation analyses and we can try to uh, make some estimations there. What we often uh, will use, um, because there's not really some really, there, there's not really easy simplified tools for this either, um, but what we'll do is use some empirical methods um, in order to look at uh, what kind of cracking we've seen before. And one of the ones we use quite a bit uh, is Pels and Fell. Um, but for a given magnitude of earthquake and a given uh, um, peak ground acceleration, so I know my, my loading, I'm going to come in and look at that pair, and then I'm going to find where I am, uh, where those, that does intersect, and then I'm going to look and see what my damage class is, and then I can come over and look and see uh, what we might expect um, for the probability of transverse cracking. And then there's a table that's not shown here that also can be used to estimate the depth of cracking based on the width of, of the cracking at the crest. And so these are the kinds of simplified tools that we have. Otherwise, you're getting into some pretty complex uh, numerical modeling and some other things to try to try to estimate, uh, in the end, uh, your probability for cracking and, and how deep those cracks could be. Because again, if you're if you have enough if you have enough freeboard to maintain the reservoir after your liquefaction, but you've had enough damage to the dam and cracking in the dam that you could have internal erosion and through concentrated leak, erosion, uh, concentrated leak erosion through those cracks, the cracks themselves have to extend deep enough for the reservoir to intersect them. So that's the other thing. Like, so if my dam displaces, I don't overtop immediately, my reservoir is lower, then the question is, what's, what kind of cracks did I induce with that displacement? And could they be deep enough that I could actually then get water into them? Can they be oriented uh, upstream, downstream, transversely? Are they deep enough that I actually can then run water through them and start to um, develop an internal erosion failure. So to recap, um, some key issues to consider here. Um, you know, what are the defensive measures of a dam? Um, so when we start to look at, you know, uh, uh, especially if it doesn't immediately overtop, um, are there filters to prevent or control internal erosion of the dam and its foundation, zones of good drainage capacity and that sort of thing? Um, we, uh, in order to understand uh, what our um, deformed dam is going to look like to be able to assess um, whether or not we have a potential for a release of, uh, of, the, of the water, we need to look at our embankment stability during and immediately after the earthquake. Um, but again, also, we need to look at our earthquake-induced deformations uh, with respect to cracking and the potential for internal erosion if our remnant section provides enough freeboard to not have immediate release of the reservoir. Um, and then uh, the last two items are around um, really understanding the potential uh, for liquefaction of our saturated, sandy, uh, and silty soils. And then uh, again, as we are changing here, some gravels with the sand silt, especially if they have a sand silt matrix in the foundation and maybe even in the bank bit. Uh, and then what our cyclic softening potential is for uh, softer specific clays in the foundation.